Good day everyone, allow me to introduce myself. I am Norman Patrick Seaman. I have a degree in abrasive sociology and I specialize in racism, hate speech and toxic masculinity in medieval poetry. It has recently come to my attention that there exists a 10th century alliterative poem called The Battle of Malden, which narrates the story of a white male called Brüchtnoth who fights a battle against the Vikings in Essex. Now, you might probably think such medieval poetry is entirely unproblematic. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Xenophobia, hate speech and toxic masculinity will obviously be found in centuries-old white poetry, and it must be our task as scientists to expose this. The cis-normative white capitalist patriarchy in which we live hasn't been created overnight. The underlying mentality dates back to medieval England, to Anglo-Saxon England, as it is called. And I will show you in the aforementioned poem, Battle of Morden. And the context of the extract we're about to read is this. There's a white cis-normative racist called Birchnoth. He is tasked with protecting the coast of Wessex and keep boats from landing anywhere, so he's basically the Frontex police of the early Middle Ages. Now, in the year 991, a fleet with Scandinavian migrants lands on a nearby island, and the refugees send a messenger to the Anglo-Saxons to request a donation. And this is the answer that Burchtnoth gives to the messenger. You can see the Old English text on the left, Old English being the language of the so-called Anglo-Saxons. And this is the answer that Burchtnoth gives. Brimmana boda abeot eftonian, saith inum leodum micle ladrespel, that here stint unforkuf eorl mitis werde, the wile ye alian edelthisne, edelredes erd eldres mines, folk and foldan, Ferlan Sheolon, Hedene et Hilde, Tohean Lich me thinketh, that ye mit urum shatum to shippe gangon, unbefochtene, nu ye thus feor hider, on urne erd in becomon. Now, again, this might sound entirely innocuous to you at first, but a closer look immediately reveals the xenophobic, hate filled vocabulary that Birchnoff uses to refer to the migrants. He addresses them as Brimmen seamen or sea folk, and this is done throughout the entire poem, the Vikings are constantly framed as creatures of the sea, as opposed to the Anglo-Saxons who inhabit the land. The Vikings are also described as heathener, as heathens, which obviously is Christian hate propaganda. Again, the heathens are set in opposition to the Anglo-Saxons and to Birchtnoth, who is depicted as a devout Christian. So what we have here is a strategic essentialism, is the artificial construct of an enemy for political gain, which is the usual practice among racists, nationalists and all enemies of progress. It is a form of hate speech known in science as othering. Creating an other of someone by using an assumed group identity is used to shift power relations in your favor and to dehumanize your opponent by framing the Vikings as foreigners, as sea creatures and heathens, the poet constructs an enemy other in order to divide society and spread hatred. It is as if Donald Trump had read that poem and applied its lessons. Anyhow, here Birchtnoth finally drops the mask and he openly states what he is fighting for. Folk and Foldan. People and land. In saying so, he implicitly claims there was a so-called West Saxon people connected through common ancestry, culture and language, and he claims that he himself was somehow a spokesperson for this so-called people. He goes on to call the land Ur-Erd, our land, and he absolutely refuses to give a donation to the Vikings. He doesn't want to let the Vikings sail away mid urum shertum, with our treasures, our treasures, as if the English wealth of the 10th century had not been created by capitalist exploitation of the international working class, as if an oppressor like Burchtnoth could actually lay claim to any riches the oppressed have produced. Make no mistake, this is pure, unadulterated racism, nationalism, chauvinism. This blood and soil ideology is what made Adolf Hitler or Donald Trump successful and it led directly to the horrors of Auschwitz and it originates in that poem. This is how it began. This poem is one of the first documents of so-called patriotism in Europe. And its poet, 
who of course is a dead white male, was the first in a long line of xenophobic English fascists like Oswald Mosley, Ricky Gervais or Boris Johnson. And believe it or not, this alt-right hate propaganda is even now taught at universities to unsuspecting students. Imagine there are young people sitting and reading such texts and they grapple with the metrical properties of the poem or the case system of Old English instead of burning those books and raising their fists in protest. This is hate speech. And it is not only the medieval sources themselves which are racist. No, the mere term Anglo-Saxon and with it the entire academic discipline that concerns itself with those so-called Anglo-Saxons is racist. Thanks to brave and innovative authors such as this lady here, this has recently been exposed. And imagine my shock when I read there are still scholars who use this racist term Anglo-Saxon when they talk about early medieval England. And these scholars are of course complicit in the dehumanization of people of color, but they keep using hate speech, they keep using the term Anglo-Saxon when they talk about early medieval England. Which of course is absolutely horrible. Historical linguistics is and has always been a deeply racist subject, as we have found out nowadays. And racist are of course the venerable old scholars as well, dead white males like Eduard Sievers. This racist xenophobe has spent his professional life uncovering the mysteries of the Germanic alliterative line in all its subtleties without even once questioning his white privilege. Eduard Sievers' theory of Germanic meter with its five metric types is still taught today in any introductory class to Old English verse. And of course, if like Sievers you devote your lifetime to centuries old poetry, you're a racist. How good that we are finally aware of this. And yes, we live, luckily, in an age when academia has finally become aware that it's the current year and racism has no place anywhere. Scholars enthusiastically rally to the flag of anti-racism and reject this made-up term Anglo-Saxon and its white supremacist ideology. And currently, progressive people all around the world are occupied exposing the deep-seated racism within our society with courage and creativity. And Make no mistake, if you want to get rid of racism, and who doesn't, are you for racism? So if you want to get rid of racism, you have to dig deep and get to the roots. You have to access all poems, comics, TV shows, films, novels and statues, every medium basically in which white supremacy is perpetuated. We have to clear our art, our culture and the academic disciplines concerned with them from racism. Only then will we create the tolerant and truly diverse society we all strive to live in. And of course, it is a foolish idea that art should be seen and judged in the context of its time. Of course, it is not so that we in our present are products of our past, are products of what our ancestors did, be it good or be it bad. It is not so that everything and everyone that came before us made us who we are. Therefore, we can and should cut ourselves off from every cultural creation of the past that is not inclusive, progressive and democratic. And of course, it is merely alt-right propaganda that our critical examination of the past creates a new form of oppression, a sinister pressure to conform. It is we, not the others, who stand for a colorful, diverse and tolerant society in which the freedom to be safe exists for everyone. Let us all strive for this society. Let us all come together and join hands. Let us dismantle Anglo-Saxon racism.